Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and we're going to have a bit of a deep dive live this afternoon, or whatever time you're watching, wherever you are in the world, on marketing. You know I love marketing. You know I believe that marketing is the single most important function of any business, uh, and you can challenge me on that, by the way. Uh, and I'm here with Richie Mehta, who is from the School of Marketing podcast, uh, and he's going to be interviewing me on all things marketing. So if you want to scale your business, if you want to make more money, if you want more leads and more income, you need to listen up. So here's Richie. What's up, Rob? And um, Richie's going to do a quick intro on his podcast, uh, you know, the concept, so he can explain it to me. Uh, and then I'll hand over to him. So Richie, fire away. So look, uh, the School of Marketing is a, a disruptive marketing education institute. Uh, we've been around for around 18 months now. Um, and what we do is we, we work on the premise that marketing pretty much changes every week. Uh, think about the, the algorithms, uh, the way consumer behavior has changed, I mean, literally over the last couple of weeks. Um, and what we felt was there was no education institution that could really keep pace with how the industry is evolving. And so it's on that basis that we decided to come together with a range of different chief marketing officers to truly create what is a, a unique institute. And as part of this, we basically run a, a daily show um, and podcast where we actually take some of the, the views of thought leaders within this space to help others to learn about some of the cutting edge techniques that are going on at the moment. And so with, with that in mind, Rob, does that give you a bit of information and context for, for us and, our, and your viewers? Yeah, that's all good. I'm in esteemed okay. company, so I hope, I hope I can live up to expectation. <laughs> Indeed you are, Robin. Look, I mean, first of all, awesome chatting with you this afternoon. Uh, crazy circumstances. Um, tell me about the key takeaways. What have you been doing over the last couple of months to really make sure that you're going to come out and thrive from this episode? Um, so last couple of months, I've focused on creating online courses because we run about 850 training days a year in our training companies. I have other companies, but our training companies. Uh, and the yeah. prospect of three or four months, no events, you know, that could be a hundred plus events that we lose. That could be five, six, seven million pounds. So um, the quick pivot was to create online courses. And we created, I believe, nine in 10 weeks. And we've got another three new ones launching. I mean, we faced the prospect of maybe losing seven, 800 grand a month. Our overhead was nearly 800 grand a month before the lockdown. Um, and, and, you know, we faced the real um, possibility that we could do no revenue and we'd just have to wait it out. Um, but the, we've done 2.7 now, 2.75 million pounds worth of online course sales in the, in the nine or so weeks from courses we didn't even have created nine weeks ago. So I'm really proud of that. We've sold hundreds of online courses. And I know that, by the way, the value is better than we've ever done. It's not just about selling courses. You know, we've offered more weekly mentoring instead of monthly, weekly masterminding. Yeah. Lots of extra bonuses and value in the courses and lower price than face-to-face. -face. And then, of course, when we're out of this lockdown, we'll probably go back to doing a lot more events, but we'll probably be a hybrid model. So that's the first thing. Just, if I could just add one more thing, just because um, this is important. I have been tripling down on my social media content in these at nine weeks too. Because I also believe social media is a massive part of marketing, as I'm sure you do, Richie. Yeah. Um, and I use this as a bit of an experiment to do three lives a day instead of two or two when I might have only been bothered to do one um, and really pushed it. A lot of my metrics went up, my downloads went up, my subscriptions went up, my following went up significantly, my viewings, my viewership was up like 300%. I unlocked a few f features on Facebook stars and now paid for live streams because I think Facebook saw me and went, you know, th this guy's putting it out there. Um, yes. Obviously, I'm doing strategy for my companies and I'm trying not to go insane and I'm trying to see my kids as much as I can. Um, I was going to say, where do you get the time, mate? Honestly, it just sounds like, you know, and, and, and what I love, what I love about what you do is, is that you're, you know, first of all, it's the energy and enthusiasm that you bring, but actually it's the tips, the tangibility of what you're talking about, which I think um, is really powerful here. And I mean, I mean, I just, I think two days ago, you talked about sort of like the 10 key things that you should be doing with your marketing rather than kind of just doing a sales job. Mm. Um, and I thought that was quite a fascinating sort of list. Um, you know, so, I mean, one of the things that I, I want to ask about is you've clearly been through a few crises. 
um, over your time and, and sort of succeeded through them. I mean, we've been through Brexit, we've gone through this. No doubt the credit crunch was a tough time too. Do you see any commonalities and, and what can people take from a variety of things that you can do? Yeah, so I fundamentally believe that you have no upside without downside and no downside without upside. So you can't have a recession without an upside opportunity. You can't have Brexit without an upside opportunity. And the lockdown, obviously, I would never say opportunity in terms of viruses or people dying. So, of course, I'm respectful of that. But that aside, e-commerce has absolutely boomed. Home delivery has absolutely boomed. Um, you know, online training has absolutely boomed. So really, the commonalities in all corrections, recessions or things like viruses is there's a movement in the way business is done and there's a movement in the way money flows. So if you think about Primark, zero revenue, Ted Baker struggling, Gap struggling. There was a big clothing company, I think, that just went into administration. So they suffer because they're not online. But of course, e-commerce and many other online sites and even sort of startup e-com people, there's the upside opportunity. So, yeah, I'd definitely say uh, that's one commonality is the upside opportunity. Another commonality is, of course, the massive fear. Uh, and there is a pandemic of fear in recessions and crashes, etc. cetera. Um, and the, I think the people that win are able, able to feel the fear and manage it and, and not let it overwhelm them and consume them because it definitely was scary at first. You know, when basically the, the government make a, a rule, almost a law, that you can't run events and you can't leave the house and you, you, know, you haven't yet tested a lot of these online courses, there's no doubt there's some fear there. But managing that fear... For me as well, um, marketing is a series of tests. Um, if anyone ever has a, a question for me in marketing, I'd say more than half the time my answer is test. So for me, I was just thinking, well, we're just going to run a lot of daily tests. We'll do this live stream. We'll do this webinar. We'll do it a day format, a two hour format, a three hour format. We'll do it on Zoom. We'll do it on GoToWebinar. We'll do it on StreamYard. We'll have this course and that course and this course and that course. And every single one of them is a series of tests. And some of them may fly and some of them may not get off the ground. Um, and I think when you have a testing mentality, I wrote the book, Start Now, Get Perfect Later. And I live by that mantra, which is you know, instead of trying to get everything really perfect. I mean, you didn't have time to get everything perfect in the lockdown, did you? So I thought, well, let's create fair exchange. Let's chuck a load of bonuses in. Let's make the price really accessible. If they're not quite perfect or not quite finished, people will forgive us because the price is accessible and there's a lot, good load of bonuses. And let's get them out to the market as quickly as possible. So there's some of the things I've learned from recessions and corrections and coronaviruses. Yeah, that, 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 sound, that sounds great. And, and Don, kind of sticking on the theme of, of learning from, some, from uh, recessions and, and I guess moving on to people, I mean, you've literally interviewed some of the most killer people in the world, right? I mean, Jordan Belfort, Amir Khan, um, Grant Coyden, even Robin Sharma. Um, I, I saw that recently. And what would you say are some of the key learnings you've taken from these guys? Oh, yeah. So, um, I'm pretty good friends with Grant and I know him well. And um, I know he has a similar ethos to me in business where he believes that speed is really important. Uh, and, you know, you're better to go fast and be imperfect than take ages to get to market and be beaten by all your competitors trying to get everything just so. So um, I know Grant fundamentally believes that and I do too. Um, I think uh, what I uh, believe Robin Sharma believes that I do too is to is that we're all creative um, and, you know, to try and do really deep and meaningful work. Um, so I think R Robin Sharma definitely believes in c developing your craft uh, and, and doing very meaningful, thorough, deep work. And to some degree, I'm more quick than I am thorough, but I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years. I've got 530 podcast episodes. I've written 15 books. Um, I, I am very deep and very obsessed about my creativity and my creation as an entrepreneur. So I, I'd certainly um, agree with that. The Jordan Belfort interview is very interesting because I think a lot of people found that voyeuristically one of my best episodes ever and my best interviews. But in terms of hardcore, actionable content, 
I'd probably say they didn't necessarily see it as the best one ever. I gave him a good few opportunities to give us some good content on selling. And, and I felt he was fairly vague about that. Um, he did show some remorse for, um, the, you know, the fact that he'd been in prison and that he'd used his influence to the negative. Um, I think most of my guests see disruption as um, going and doing something that um, is new and innovative and is, is, is not just a step, but maybe leap years ahead of your competitors. Um, you know, you make such an impact that you throw everyone else off course. You completely shake up an industry, maybe even completely revolutionize it. I'd say a lot of my guests have that or similar um, ethos or belief in what disruptive means. Because I ask every single one of my guests, what does disruptive mean to you? That's definitely a commonality. I think of all the billionaires I've interviewed, I've interviewed a lot. They all seem to agree that, um, you know, you want to become more wealthy and successful yourself. You've got to serve people, serve more people and you'll become more wealthy. And also that the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest opportunities for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are problem solvers. Uh, and some of the world's biggest problems, they need solving by entrepreneurs because we're able to do the creative and the service with the commercial too. Um, and, and we're that fine balance, aren't we, between the private and the public sector. We maybe have a bit of both in us. So there's what, five or six lessons there from Amazing. some of my guests. Rob, you know, I, I, I must ask, I mean, how many hours a day do you work? Um, okay, so I, get, I got up at 2.30 this morning, but I'm normally up at 5. So I'm up between 2... Uh, I'm up, you're, up, part, you're, part, you're part of the 5 a.m. club. Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, up between two, I'm up between 3 and 5, really. Um, and I don't... <laughs> this is difficult to pin, um, because... If you'd have caught me four and a half years ago, I was traveling around the world. I'd just written Life Leverage. I was working from my phone. I was taking my son around all the World Golf Championships because he was playing in the under six World Championships at five and six. Um, and I wasn't really working much. And we had our staff and I had a lot of systems and processes and, and I could re work remotely. Uh, and, I'm, and then when we didn't play so much golf with Bobby... Um, and then when maybe I got a little bit bored of just traveling, because I did, I'm not really the greatest traveler. Um, I kind of wanted to get back in the office and I started my podcast and I started writing more books and I, I really got stuck my teeth into work again and I really enjoyed it. Um, I know I'm going around the houses here, Richie, but it's important to give an accurate answer. I, I'm quite random with how much I work. I think about business all day, every day. Um, I have to turn my brain off and I find that hard and I don't even want to, to be honest. I don't even, if I go on long walks, I want to think about business. I want to speak to, um, you know, business owner, friends of mine and figure out what, what they're doing well and what we can figure out. Um, in terms of hours, I actually physically put pen to paper and work, honestly, maybe about four hours a day. Um, but in terms of how much I think about business, 12 hours a day plus. Um, and I, yeah, exactly. And, and that's because it's my greatest passion. It really is my greatest passion. And in that regard, I'm very fortunate. I mean, look, I do do quite a lot of social media and you could regard that as work or you could regard that as play. I don't know. A lot of my work is play. A lot of my passion is my profession and profession is my passion. So it's hard to separate it. But I'm it, just, I, 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 yeah, I'm just really, I'm, I'm really intrigued as to how you actually manage a multi-million pound business and are able to do all the social media stuff, plus write books, podcasts. I mean, how would you kind of carve out that balance? And how would you, I can, how would you advise people if they're trying to do something similar, perhaps not on the same scale as the business that you're running, yeah. but actually just more on the sense of, of getting a balance if they've got ambitions to do more stuff? Okay. So I wrote a book called Routine Equals Results. And in that book, it's a short practical book. It basically teaches you how to compartmentalize your diary into small chunks, putting in your key life areas, key result areas and income generating tasks, removing all wastage and admin, um, batching time and tasks together. Like I did a three hour, work, three hour walk yesterday. I did 26 calls, smashed them all out in a three hour walk. I batch things together. I do things. I often these podcast interviews, I'm normally doing one a day. I do them at this time. I do lives at a certain time work at a certain time, I've checked my energy highs and flows and ebbs and lows and when I drink my coffee and when I should be on calls and when I should be on social media. 
Um, so reading routine equals results will help you maximise your time, become productive, effective, efficient. Um, but for me, uh, it, the main thing is I love to um, think about business, strategize about business. I love to speak to people about business. I love to do social media content. Um, so in that regard, you, you, I think you can always take on a lot more of what you love to do. Like if, if you got me uh, running yoga classes, I'd do one or two of them a day and I'd be fatigued. I'd be overwhelmed. I'd be, I, I wouldn't feel very good about myself because I'm just not interested in it. And I just can't do it and I just don't know how to do it. But you could give me five businesses to run and I'll have a go at them all because I enjoy it. I like having a lot of things on the go. I like the variety. It's quite common with entrepreneurs. The downside of that is I get overwhelmed from time to time and I just have to know my limits. I also have a lot of staff, so I'm able to start things and outsource the finishing to them. I'm, out, I'm able to cut a deal and then outsource the legals and the communication and the negotiation to them. I'm able to have an idea for a course and then outsource the implementation to them. So it's also about building your network and your staff and your team. And you think, Rob, think in today's context, given, I know, given uh, sort of an, a new asset light model that's probably upon us, given, you know, COVID sort of days, do you think all of that sort of outsources, outsourcing can happen without a whole lot of fixed cost? Do you think there's the, you know, are we in a world of Upwork and Fiverr that's going to take, take hold? Yeah, I've, I've, got a, um, I've got a paradoxical view on outsourcers. On the one hand, I've had what you might deem a VA. I mean, he's way more than a VA. He's a legend. He's my agent. He does so much for me. But we found him nearly 15 years ago. And he's what you call a super fan. So, you know, hopefully people who've got a bit of a social media following, even if it's small, you have your super fans, you know, your top commenters, the people that, you know, might even sort of stalk you a little bit. He won't mind me saying he stalked us a little bit. He used to call us up a lot. And he was a super fan. And he just said, look, I want to work for you guys. I want to give me stuff. He was hungry and motivated. He had quite a unique situation at home, which meant it suited him. Um, and we just gave him research jobs and bits and bobs. And he just did them so well and so quickly. And now he's on a full time wage. I bought him a car, bought him a Rolex, bought him all sorts of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and now I couldn't do without him. Um, and we use loads of outsourcers for editing, for podcasts, for video, for transcriptions, for research. So, yes, I think it's a, an amazing opportunity for you to be able to outsource admin, even some income generating tasks, things you're not very good at, research, um, data collation and presentation, um, even like, you know, do, having your management accounts and all that kind of stuff, you can get outsourced, can't you, from bookkeepers that work remotely. But there are a few people that think you can go on Fiverr.com or get someone from the Philippines for £200 a millennium and they'll just do everything for you and be a legend from day one without any work, uh, you know, or any guidance. That a lot of people don't do proper job request templates. They don't set about tasks properly and they don't manage people properly. So it's not a get, it's not a, a like, I was going to say get rich quick. It's not really about wealth. It's not a get rid of all your work quick. I've worked with my VA for 15 years. I've taught him how to write as if he is me. I've worked with him when he's made mistakes. I've allowed him to make mistakes. He's grown with us. He's learned about who I am and how I work. Um, and so absolutely, you could get multiple VAs who could be brilliant, but you've got to invest in them, invest time with them. You've got to train them. You've got to have good systems and processes and resources and job request templates and, and, and proper um, job descriptions if you want them to be really good. I love that. And, and you know, it's, it's funny because my reflection of, of, of the way you do things, Rob, is that you, you, know, you very much are a people person who actually gives time to people. And I think that's, you know, you, you talk about on your LinkedIn profile that you're being a mentor. I mean, is that something you do quite often? Is that something you believe in? And do you feel there's a concept of reverse mentoring as a consequence of that? Um, so, yeah, like, I'm happy to say I'm an entrepreneur because I know I am and no one can say any different. I'm happy to say I'm a mentor because I've helped tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and, you know, my mentoring program is always full. Um, I've got, in fact, I've got three, two masterminds and a mentoring program. They're always full and they're um, 15, 25 and 40,000 pounds. I know that that is worth it because I know the results people have gotten. And I know what I'm worth because when I started 
mentoring, it was £2,000 and I only had a couple of years experience and I was helping newbies and now I'm helping multimillionaires, I'm helping celebrities, I have a lot of celebrity clients that you know, I mentor. So yeah, I'm a mentor, I, I'm, per, I'm not perfect, of course. And yeah, hey, look, if you, uh, if you wanna go from one billion to 10 billion, I'm not your man, because I'm not at a billion yet. If you wanna go from zero to a million, a million to five, five to 10, 10 to 20, you wanna set up any kind of business that I'm in, you wanna do social media and have, have some decent influence and reach, I believe I'm your man, if, as long as you're um, committed and focused. Um, yep. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and proud and, and comfortable and confident and certain to call myself a mentor, to call myself an entrepreneur. Um, I am also a student. I'm a student. This is important to say. I am the hungriest student you will ever find. Um, if I'm in a room full of people, I'll shut up and I'll let them talk and I'll learn from them. I'm not the guy that just goes over. I know I am in these interviews, but that's my job. Um, but, you know, if we're, if we're in a business or a networking situation and I can learn from someone, I'm, I'm listening and I'm letting, them, I'm letting them give me all the information. Um, I go on loads of courses. I've got mentors myself. I'm in masterminds myself. I listen to podcasts and audio books regularly. So I'm as much of a student as I am a mentor. And I think that's vital. Uh, absolutely. And I think it's just, uh, you know, the, the whole point of constant and, and continued learning is key. Um, and on that note, in terms of talking about some of the people who have mentored you, I mean, you're probably one of the, you know, the best sort of um, contact lists or books or whatever you would call it. Um, and, and other people would be quite uh, keen to understand. I mean, how do you develop that over time? How do you maintain those relationships? How do you grow those relationships into something quite sustainable? Okay, so if you want the modern way, like th- I've never really said it like this, but if you want the modern way of building an amazing black book of contacts, celebrities, millionaires, billionaires, start a podcast and interview people because you meet some amazing people. I'm sure you have, um, Richie, I have. I've got many celebrities who, are, who I would deem and they would deem to me too to be very close friends now. Um, all thanks to reaching out and, and being on their podcast or their being on mine. Um, I've, I think I've interviewed now eight billionaires. I think we've got another three agreed. Where else would you meet eight billionaires? I mean, you know, like there's not like a billionaires networking event or, <laughs> hey, there's billionairesaresingle.com where you can go and date a billionaire. I agree. No, but you know, the, I think that I think the key thing is people are just apprehensive and scared. And I think and I think more than that is they just don't know how to approach the situation. So what type of tips and advice would you give someone about trying to approach uh, and getting to that status and kind of getting these people on your show? Yeah. What are the kind of the, the techniques that you would use to do that? OK, so I'm fairly laid back about approaching people. Um, so before podcasts, Mark and I, if we were interested in someone like Andreas Paniotu, he uh, met with us a few times. He's a billionaire in property. Um, there were some guys on Dragon's Den and um, some people who were also in Peter Jones's academy who were worth like 200 million. Mark and I would just message them or um, you'd try and find their phone number and call them up. Just vet, you know, like sometimes you can put a lot of pressure on yourself. You have to write a script. You have to do it in the right way. And, and look, that you definitely don't want to write long messages to people. That's a massive no-no. You don't want to talk all about you. That's a massive no-no. You want to have done your research. So I'm trying to get 50 Cent on my podcast. His audio book's really good. And he's into conscious capitalism. Um, he believes when you cut deals, you um, don't take a big fee at the front. You get equity and you go for long-term deals. So when I approach him now, I'm able to show that I've listened to his audio book and show that I know what he's about and show some relatability. And that really helps. And, and, and you know, people feel respected because people get pitched all the time. I get pitched every single day. People want to use me and abuse me for my following or um, they want me to do this or do that. They want me to write forwards. They want me to do all this and that and that. And that's fine. But, you know, if, if they just want something from me without being able to offer anything, that makes it harder for me. But um, Instagram messages work well, especially on a Sunday. It seems that a lot of very big, famous people will read their own messages on a Sunday. Handwritten letters is the little secret that no one's doing. Because back in the day, you know, written DM used to be the way and then email took over. But um, if you, I, I get lots of replies from handwritten letters. But in terms of meeting people, going to talk to people, I just introduce myself and get them talking. I just get them talking. Um, because once you've got someone talking, then they're comfortable. And, you know, we all like to talk. 
So just become yeah. a good listener. I said, I think I love, I love your thought about the handwritten letters, right? My, my strategy for 2020 come well, back, back in Jan, <laughs> before, before the world blew up was literally to reach out to sort of some of the, the key influential CMOs um, and, and literally just kind of, and I, and I probably had some sort of cold, sort of some semi-warm sort of introduction to them in the past. And I just wrote them a handwritten letter about how much I appreciated that. And it genuinely worked wonders, perhaps not necessarily to get in the door to someone I'd never met before, but actually if I had met them and then I wrote a letter on the back of that, it just absolutely solidified that relationship to the point now where I can call them mentors of mine because yeah. they've uh, you know because they were receptive to it so i love that i love that thinking it works cold Obviously. as well i wrote to vivian westwood i wrote to david Atterborough. they both wrote That's back true. yeah so it works cold as well hey rob I, I actually made a song uh for 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 one of them it was probably a bit stalkerish as you mentioned before um i hope you didn't do it naked <laughs> no definitely not. it wasn't a video it was on soundcloud um but it was funny because I had a really good friend of mine who was trying to get sponsorship for his conference business. Um, and, and I guess like you, he did, you know, he did 70 conferences a month all around the UK. And um, he was trying to basically get one of the big, sort of the big uh, co-working spaces to, to take him on. And he didn't get much traction until he wrote them a song. And then suddenly the sort of world opened up. So I thought, hey, you know, best example there, to, uh, did, did the same. Uh, and, and funny enough, dec- decided to do it, the, uh, a take on Elton John's Your Song. Um, it was pretty, pretty cool. I'll send it to you after. You can listen to it and have a laugh. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure it's, not sure it's won me millions worth of business, but, uh, you know, a fun thing to do in the evening. Yeah. Um, Rob, you've got an amazing personal brand. How did you carve that out over time? Like, what did you do? I mean, how did you kind of build this up? I think consistent content is vital for a personal brand. I think understanding your space. So, you know, disruption, disruptive, um, I'd say those words probably do sum up my brand. I know that in America that means something a bit more different or cliche, but I don't care. Um, It seems to sum me up well. So having a theme, a space, an identity, consistent content, and then using multimedia. So uh, I use Facebook pages, Facebook supporter, Facebook stars, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, you you know, you name it. Um, That helps give yourself reach. I think having something interesting to say and, and having a, a slightly unique way of saying it, I think also that um, helps build a personal brand. So how does uh, progressive property fit into that mix? Because I mean, I, I see you talking a lot about different sort of things and, 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 and how does that then, you know, how does that then, that, that component then fit into this, this well, equation here? Well, I think people know I co-own progressive property, but actually people who follow me for new probably don't know that that's one of my companies. Um, what, maybe six or seven years ago, um, everyone knew Progressive Property as Rob and Mark, my business partner, Mark Homer, Rob and Mark at Progressive. And, y- you know, all of our courses were delivered by Mark and I. We, we wrote all the books. We did all the training. Um, and that was fine, but it stunts your growth um, because there was one year I did 250 training days and it absolutely battered me. I, I was just really done that year. Um, and, you know, now we do 850 training days and we'll probably get over a thousand once we're out of this lockdown per year and then all the online ones. So you have to get yourself out of a, a company brand if you want it to scale. So Mark and I created our own brands, separated ourselves from Progressive. So Progressive is one of our companies, but we have trainers and leaders and managers of that brand. Um, and, and really, we, we, you know, we both have our own personal brand. And, you know, if someone is trying to follow in your footsteps, um, potentially a young person uh, wanting to become an entrepreneur in, in what potentially is a very difficult time to, to start up, scale up, uh, what kind of stuff would you say to them? Like, what, would you, what advice would you give? Okay, so um, I actually don't think it's a hard time to start up a business. I think it's probably an easier time because the world has been leveled and flattened and your competitors have been disrupted. And many of them are scaling back and, and ad, a lot of ads are now a lot cheaper than they were because the competition is less. So I actually think if you're a lean startup, you have an advantage right now and you should take advantage of that. Um, that's the first thing. I think if someone was to follow my footsteps, the first thing to remember is um, you shouldn't want to be me. Um, it's taken me a decent amount of time to find my own voice and figure out my unique space. Um, You know, in in the early years, I probably modelled the people I was influenced by. And then more over time, I found my own voice and 
uh, create my own things. I'm probably still influenced. I think that we're all influenced and I'm proud of that. If you know, like I've got lots of good mentors myself, but I think you've got to try and find your own voice. Um, I, I think if there's elements of what I've done that you want to model, whether it's buying a lot of property or writing a lot of books or having a prolific podcast or being on a lot of social media channels, then obviously you can follow me and watch what I do and how I do it and, and borrow some of those techniques. Just make sure you don't copy um, because I, I don't I don't in the early years, you know, I, I probably used to think copying was quite good because, you know, you save yourself all the time. Um, but then if when people copy me now, it's so obvious I get copied a lot. Uh, and people are oh, you're just trying to be like Rob. So it actually helps me, not them, by them copying me. Um, so I would say you can model strategies and tactics that might work for you, but you've got to find your own voice. And so for me, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with putting myself on camera pretty much anywhere at any time. I'm comfortable with talking without notes. I'm comfortable with being pretty passionate and enthusiastic. I'm comfortable. How long, how long did that take you, by the way? Like, what, well, what it, the kind of the it's an ongoing journey, I think. I mean, I did my first public speaking course in 2006. And I was absolutely petrified, absolutely petrified. Um, and I would say... Oh, for the first six months, even though I was probably giving it a bit of bravado, learning what, you know, implementing what I learned, I was probably still inside really nervous. I mean, if I speak, speak on a big stage now, you know, thousand plus, and I haven't spoken for three months on a stage like that, I still get butterflies and I still get quite nervous. And I think that that's a good thing. I think it keeps you humble, keeps you um, the opposite of complacent, you know, make sure you work on your craft, develop your speech. Um so it's a progressive journey, is it? It's an ongoing thing. It wasn't like one day I'm confident and certain because, you know, if I could make a few mistakes now, my confidence could go down a bit. I could have a few wins and it could go up. I think nowadays, I it's a bit easier nowadays. Well, some things are easier, some things are harder. But what is easier is it's kind of easier to put yourself out there. You know, 15 years ago, everyone wasn't doing lives. You know, you had blogs, of course. Um, but, you know, there wasn't the lives or the, the quick videos you could do, the selfie videos. But now it's much easier to just put yourself out there, set up your own Facebook group, set up your own Instagram profile, do an Instagram live, just do a one little minute, vid one minute video on your camera and put it on your Instagram, put little, vid little lives up on your story. And these are all very low risk ways of getting a voice and some content and a message out there. And then you expand to bigger realms like multi streams. And, you know, I, I get I get paid to do, you know, online summits and I get paid to do, you know, keynote speeches and stuff like that. That, that builds over time. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, 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 can, I can totally understand that. And um, I mean, I think, I think a lot of the time, you know, some uh, people kind of see the Rob Moore, kind of the 15 years later version of that. Um, what would you say were kind of some of the stumbling points that you've had along the way and things that you probably learned your biggest lessons from? Um. I mean, I think most of our stumbling blocks, because don't forget, I mentor hundreds of people at once, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. I think nearly all of our stumbling blocks are um, our own inner dialogue, our own belief and perception of ourselves. So, but I'll come back to that. Obviously, knowledge and experience. Sorry, once someone's at the door. Do you want to answer it? Yeah, you can. You're not allowed to answer the door. Oh, okay. Can I just go answer the door, Richie? I'll only be a sec. Um, yeah, no worries, mate. Uh, Bob, do you want to come and just take over the live for a sec? Just come and talk on the live? Yeah. Go on, then. There you go. Look, you're there. <laughs> take over, Bobby Moore. Hey. How you doing, Bobby? Good. I heard you're a golfer. Mm, a bit. Yeah. Have you been playing golf over the last couple of months? Yeah. Yeah? And have you been, like, doing homeschooling or are you back at school yet? Homeschooling. All right, and how's that going? You enjoying it? Yeah. Yeah? Is is your dad teaching you? No. <laughs> oh, I'm back. It was just a delivery. Sorry about that, Richie. Oh, well. um, <laughs> That's all right. So... Yeah, look, the quicker you can build a good knowledge base, yeah. obviously knowledge is important for your own confidence, but obviously knowledge builds experience and, and then that helps with your credibility. So I think that's uh, important. Um, and then um, assuming knowledge and experience is there, I, I would then probably say um, you are not your failures. 
So when you make mistakes, you just go, you know what? I'm a human being. I tried my best. I'm not my failures. So um, I'll try again and again and again. I think being able to take rejection regularly. I try and challenge myself to be rejected every single day. I try and do something that makes me feel uncomfortable or scary. Reaching out to someone scary. Saying something scary. Every day. Every day. Every day. How am I going to grow if I don't? Who did you reach out to today? Okay, so I've got um, someone who I haven't spoken to in a little, little bit, a while who's, um, he is stroke, was a very good friend. There's been some conflict there. Um, and, and I reached out and sort of reached out an olive branch and just said, look, mate, hey, look, I miss you. And, um, you know, maybe we should chat. And, you know, I, you do that and you risk getting rejected. Um, uh, you know, and so I, I did that today. Um, you know, I, I talked to you about, a guest I'm trying to get on a podcast, I talked to you about 50 Cent. Well, you know, maybe my pride doesn't want me to talk about the guests I'm trying to get because I've got to have so many good guests, you know, I could just get guests when I want. Um, and reaching out to people. It, Sometimes I reach out it, to is, someone and I think there's no way they're going to be on my podcast. They're too big. And I still go and do it anyway. A difficult conversation, uh, you know, a conversation where there might be some conflict. I challenge myself to do that. So I think if you can challenge yourself through your own fears um, and, you know, embrace failure along the way. The next thing is starting things and knowing that they're not perfect, but getting them done anyway and knowing that you'll get better because that's why I wrote Start Now, Get Perfect Later because so many people are just not prepared to do anything until they're really good at it. But you can't get really good at anything until you start being really bad at it. Like every winner was once a beginner and every master was once a disaster. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I, I am, I, I make mistakes. I'm certainly not perfect. I think I, I'm quite chaotic. I push things and people and myself quite fast. Sometimes I do things too fast, but I'll always learn. I'll always listen. Um, and I'll always do my best to, best to fix things when they go wrong. Mate, you know, you epitomize the, uh, the thought around growth mindset. To be honest, I think that's very much at the heart of, of the ethos that you're describing here, right? It just feels like that's kind of, you know, what, what you're always trying to do to kind of constantly challenge yourself, constantly try and get yourself out there, put yourself in that sort of stretch zone constantly um, in order to try and almost advance yourself and make yourself feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel good to feel uncomfortable, although you can, <laughs> you can teach yourself for, to get a sadistic kick out of it, like a bit of a, a, an adrenaline rush. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I'd never really defined it as the growth mindset, though I suppose it, that does make sense. I mean, growth and progress is one of my highest values and I'm always looking to grow, you know, whether it's my reach, my impact, my ability to mentor, what I know and understand, you know, what I, I put in my head and what I learn, my own capacity for risk or dealing with fear or stress. I'm always trying to grow those things. I think it's a, it's a natural, natural entrepreneurial desire to grow. You know, no human being that I know of wakes up and says, I want to be worse today and I want to be smaller today and I want to mean less today, um, unless we're maybe really but, stressed and hiding many, away. But not many individuals actually then go on to, 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 to take the flip side and say, actually, I want to advance. I want to make, you know, to take the change. I want to then, you know, grow and put myself in those situations. Yeah, maybe. I think it takes... Maybe. A different situation there. Robert, I, I've just got two last questions for you because I know your time is precious. And I know that one of the big things that you're talking about at the moment is around being this big believer in marketing. So um, from that perspective, what kind of tips or top tips would you give either, either content creators at this point in time um, or other people who are trying to kind of um, grow their businesses from a brand perspective? What kind of tips would you say would be important to them? OK, well, I definitely think you should be leveraging all low cost and free social media. You should have an account on all social media and you should be um, putting out content, repurposing content across multiple channels, testing content across multiple channels and trying to figure out what works on multiple channels. I think you should probably focus on one or two main ones. So for me, podcast, YouTube and Facebook are the three I focus on main ones. Um, because obviously you can get really overwhelmed if there's like 15 different social media channels. Exactly. I think every person who runs a business who, um, you know, who does marketing should have a testing mentality, which means you should test new Amazon ads. You should test stars if you can get it, test supporters if you can get it, test patron if you can get it. Um, if you're not running Google ads, test Google ads, um, you know, test new pay-per-click 
um, Facebook pay-per-click group ad groups. Um, join a load of other Facebook groups and test your content in them and see how well they get received and just perform um, an increased volume of tests because some things will work well uh, and you don't know until you try it. And a lot of people either don't try it or they think they know it. But in reality, what works is um, what you test and is proven to work and you often don't know it will work until you try it. Um, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs overinflate their ability for their market intuition. So yes, yeah, Steve Jobs didn't need to do much research. He knew people didn't want to use a little toggle. They wanted to use their finger. And, but you know, that guy had a lot of experience in his market over a long time and he had market intuition. And until you've got market intuition, you should use testing. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a really simple concept. Um, anything else with marketing? You've got to track all your metrics. Um, so if you don't track all of your key performance indicators, if you don't know your, you know, your cost per click, your cost per opt-in, your cost per registration, your cost per sale, your revenue per sale, your revenue per head, um, your revenue per event, your lifetime client value, um, your customer, customer acquisition lead source per source, the cost of the acquisition lead source, and then the lifetime client value per lead source. Blah, I could go on and on and on. If you don't know all of these metrics then you're, you're burning marketing spend or you're not spending enough. So for me, when I've got a, an, an, an ad campaign, a vertical, a funnel that works, I want to spend more money down it because it works. I want to throw money at it. And then others that don't work obviously want to stop spending money. So um, you know, tracking your KPIs is vital. Awesome. What's the role for creativity on the, on the back of that? What's the... What's the role of creativity within your marketing? Hmm. So create, creativity comes from innovative launches. It comes from innovative angles and concepts for your books, your podcasts, your events. Um, I would say a, a new way to reinvent what people are doing at the moment to make the wheel seem different. Um, because let's be honest, most ideas aren't new anymore, but reinventing the wheel means that presenting a new wheel, it's still a wheel, but it's a new wheel. Um, if you think about it, online events are a new way of doing live events. And then we were doing two or three hour webinars and then we were doing one day live streams. And then when the weather got really hot, we did evening, um, like weekly events. So two or three hours each evening. And we're always trying to disrupt and break up how we present our events, the, the, te the tech and the platforms that you use. Um, creativity, innovation, I think that those words are quite loaded in that a lot of people think you have to be some kind of Steve Jobs genius or some mad professor inventor or whatever, or you have to come up with a eureka moment in the shower or in the bed, in your bed at three in the morning, and it has to be new and disruptive. That's nonsense. The, the, the post-it note, which was a failed glue, um, you know, that was an, an, a massive innovation. Um, actually, there's a lot of innovations that were f the accidents or failures, like penicillin, for example, cornflakes, for example. They were all things left overnight by accident. So actually, innovation and creativity is just figuring out a problem. It's all it is. It's figuring out a problem in, in a way that you can be successful or profitable or create value. Wow. That was, that's awesome. Uh, Rob, last question. Um, if you, were going to give your, if you were going to give your younger self some advice, what would it be? How young am I? Go 18. 18. Um, stop getting drunk all the time and start your business. <laughs> Why, mate? It served you well. Jeez. Yeah, well, I was, I was partying the whole time when I was 18. And do you know what? My dad raised me to be an entrepreneur. I should have hustled at university. I shouldn't have gone to university. It's just a complete waste of time. But um, I, I just... I just went because that's apparently if you're... Ralphie, come here. My dog's here. Let me show you my dog. There he is. Look. A little Westie. He's just had a haircut. You can have a... Here he is. Look, Richie. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Amazing. I met your whole family today there, Rob. Yeah, you have. Yeah, yeah. you've met the dog, my son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have the postman. Um, so yeah, look, I didn't start my business soon enough. I had fears and concerns. I haven't got enough money. I'm not good enough at it. Um, and, and I, I started my own business properly. I, I tried some things, but I started my own business properly when I was 26 and, um, I should have been doing it when I was 18, really. Um, I was also, I, I wasn't confident at 18. I had this external bravado and cockiness, which was really a compensator for 
inside I was scared and feared rejection. And I'd say to myself, don't don't worry so much about what people think about you. Um, You know, go and pursue your dreams and take risks. And, you know, even such a thing as I'd never ask anyone out, even if I was told by a friend that they liked me, I just wouldn't because I didn't have the courage or I thought they might reject me. Um, Or I I used to do art and I wouldn't take my art into any galleries because I was scared of the gallery owner rejecting the art. And I put this bravado, this false... Um, identity of cockiness around it as a protection mechanism and I should have got rid of all of that love it well Rob I mean I've I've absolutely loved chatting to you this afternoon you too Richie brilliant and and and, you know really hearing the insights of of what you've had to say and and potentially you know and and certainly helped others I'm sure um, just around the tangibility of some of the thoughts that you have And, and for me the key takeaway is just be brave about reaching out to people um, and starting, you know, starting your own podcast, I guess that's the journey that I'm on. But, you know, nailing down some some great people on it is probably the key, the key thing that I'm going to take away from this conversation. So it was absolutely brilliant chatting with you, Rob, and I um, hope we can do it again, maybe maybe in months to come or whenever, um, when we could uh, maybe show you some of the results of what uh, of some of the advice that you've given me this afternoon. Sure thing. So this was the School of Marketing podcast. Um, and my, my podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Um, it's been a pleasure, Richie. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers now. Cheers. Bye. 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 And those of you still on the live, here's my dog. This is Ralph. Ralph, do you want to say hello? (laughs) Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Uh, I'm getting a studio built, by the way, in like an extension wing I've had built in the house. Um, and so I'm going to be, when I do these lives where people interview me, instead of me having the, the computer like this, and I just do this because, you know, a, a lot of times I do these podcasts to, uh, to help people out who are doing their early podcasts. Obviously, some of them are quite big, but rather than just doing it on Zoom, I live it out to you so you can see the content. Obviously, it's, you know, I haven't got a headset. It's not professional setup because our, off, our studio in the office is obviously shut because of the COVID. So I'm just doing it in my living room, as you can see. Sorry about the hair. <laughs> Um, here's the dog, Ralphie. <laughs> um, but what I will do, is we're building a studio at home, so I'll have a more professional setup for these um, live streams and Zooms and interviews, so it'll be a better um, experience, just letting you know. Love you all. If you want to shout out for your business, your brand, your podcast, your website, your Facebook group, anything that you want to promote, um, then just hit me up with 500 stars on this live. Um, and if you do it while I'm live, I'll actually call it out. Um, and if you're watching the replay, you just hit 500 stars and then share the link to whatever product or service you want to promote. I have 144,000 people now that follow me on this page. Yes, this is my dog, Ralph. Ralphie. Yeah, he's just had his haircut. Look, Um, feeling very pleased with himself. Um, So yeah, 500 stars will get you a shout out. It's only $5 to me. Um, We've got our marketing summit starting tonight, um, every evening, all week, bit.ly forward slash marketing RM. That's bits.ly for slash marketing RM. Um, and we're doing two, one or two keynotes every evening. We've got LinkedIn tonight, and that's a big one. Um, new content there. So bit.ly for slash marketing RM. Thanks for tuning in. Love you all. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.